he provides a beautiful life. Live for him. If you will turn to Ephesians chapter 3, we'll begin at verse 14. We began looking at this last week, and um, we'll finish up today, Lord willing. We read this passage uh, for our responsive reading. I do want to call your attention to uh, something that, a few things we looked at last week. Paul prays for the believers that they would be strengthened with power through the Spirit. And he, did, he does that in verse 16 so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith in verse 17. And then in verse 19, that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That you would be filled with the fullness of God and that God's glory would be made manifest and proclaimed. Each of these elements build on one another. They're, they're stepping stones. Each of these make what MacArthur calls a grand process of enablement. So when we think about these passages and how, how we're going to work through them today, it's building up to a point. And these enable us to fulfill our calling. Let's look at verse 14. The first heading that we looked at last week was the Holy Spirit empowers us. He strengthens our inner man, our inner being. So in verse 14, it says, For this reason I bow my knee before the Father. For this reason, Paul prays for the Ephesians and for us to use this power, this status that we've gained in Christ and that he has provided. Because of God's power in believers, Paul prays that God would enable them to use the fullness of that power. And he prays, he says, on bended knee before the Father. Bowing the knees represents an attitude of submission and recognition of God's holiness, his dignity, his authority. Look at verse 15. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. This refers to the saints of every age. Now and in heaven, those who still remain on earth, all of God's people are to be like Paul in having an overriding sensitivity to the spiritual needs of others for the salvation of the unsaved and for the spiritual protection and growth of those who are saved. Again in verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Those and many others are the riches that every believer has in Jesus Christ. Paul is not praying for God to give us these riches, but that he would grant believers the strength by God according to the riches they already have possession of. He wants us to live lives that correspond to this spiritual wealth that we have in Christ. Christ dwelling in us. The second point that we looked at. In verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. The, the purpose of our being strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner man or the inner being is that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And remember we talked about this, this dwelling being rooted and grounded, but this dwelling is literally to settle down and to feel at home. You've been in situations where someone may have invited you to their house, or maybe there was a conversation in a hallway, and you were just not comfortable. For whatever number of reasons, or maybe just a single reason, you weren't comfortable there. 
You may have stayed there in the presence, in that home or in that conversation, but you just didn't feel comfortable there. Paul prays that that he would dwell, that Christ would dwell in us and and have that feeling of of being at home, of, of comfort, of dwelling there. This third point that Paul prays for is that Christ's love would master us. In the last half of verse 17 through the beginning of verse 19, that you being rooted and grounded in love might have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Hear the full impact of this progression. Paul is praying through this to a point Being made strong inwardly by God's Spirit leads us to Christ being at home in us, which leads to love that is incomprehensible. Once again, being made strong inwardly by God's Spirit leads to Christ being made at home in us, which leads to love that is incomprehensible. So far in our progression, we're working our way up to this point which is incomprehensible love. This is what Paul is praying. The, 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 um, the riches that we all have, that they would be made manifest in this incomprehensible love. The result of our yielding to the Spirit's power and submitting to Christ's lordship in our lives is love. When Christ settles down in our lives, he begins to display his own love in us and through us. When he freely indwells our lives, we become rooted and grounded in love. That is, settled on a strong foundation of love. Let's take a look at just a couple of these passages. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. We're not to compare our love for each other based on how other people love. We're to base our loving other people on how Christ has loved us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Do you hear the, the seriousness? This is sincere love of the brethren, fervently loving one another from the heart. Galatians chapter 5, beginning of verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Brother Joe mentioned this passage uh, Wednesday night in our prayer time. This first rich item that we have, or this, these riches that we have in Christ, begins with love. And the rest of these flow from that. Love is an attitude of selflessness. We have an opportunity to battle this every morning when we get up and all day long. Right? Well, you guys may not. I certainly do. Living selfless is totally contrary to who we are in our natural state. Biblical love is a matter of the will and not a matter of feeling or emotion. Although deep feelings and emotions almost always accompany this type of love, God's loving the world was not a matter of feeling. It resulted in him sending his son, his only son, to redeem the world. 
Love is selfless and giving. Always selfless and always giving. It is the very nature and substance of love to deny self and to give to others. Jesus did not say, greater love has no one than to have warm feelings for his friends. That, that's not what he said. We see here in this passage in John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. This is also pictured in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. The love of God was manifest in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. That's what Paul's praying for here, that we would live through him. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. When the Spirit empowers our lives and Christ is obeyed as Lord of our lives, the sins and weaknesses are dealt with and we find ourselves wanting to serve others. Wanting to sacrifice for them. Because we're good people? No, not because we're good people. Because Christ's loving nature has truly become our own nature. This will be a struggle that we have until we die. Loving is the supernatural attitude of the Christian because God is the nature. Love is the nature of Christ. This is supernatural. So a question. If this supernatural nature of a believer if this is what Christ is living in us and we're working to live out through him, what has to happen for someone who is a believer to not live out their nature? Granted, we have a sin nature that we struggle with, but if Christ is living within us, we have this, this riches that Paul's talking about here, and one of them is this supernatural love that should be lived out. If that is part of the nature that Christ brings when he comes to live, his spirit lives in us, what has to happen for us to not live that out? Another way to think about this, just for a second, humor me here. At the count of three, I want you to hold your breath for two seconds, okay? One, two, three. All right, you can exhale. We had to intentionally purpose to not breathe. Why? Breathing is something naturally that we do. The thing I want us to think about with this topic here of, of, of this progression in the prayer of Christ's love mastering us. I have my sin nature. I'll have that until I reach glory. But if Christ has come to dwell, if his spirit has come to dwell in me, bringing this new nature, I have a nature within me that is the nature of Christ now. For me to not live nature out is like me having to hold my breath. I can't do that naturally. I have to intentionally not breathe. For us to not live out this new nature that we have, we have to do something. Granted, it involves our own flesh. When a Christian does not love, he has to do so, do so intentionally and with effort because we have this supernatural indwelling, this riches of Christ in us. Loving is the supernatural attitude of the Christian because love is the nature of Christ. When a Christian does not 
love, he has to do so intentionally and with effort, just as we had to hold our breath. When Christ has the proper place in our lives, we don't have to hold in love. We don't have to be told to love, just as we do not have to be told to breathe. Eventually, it must happen, because loving is natural to the spiritual person as breathing is to our natural person. Although this is, it is unnatural for the Christian to be unloving, it is still possible to be disobedient in regard to love. Just as loving is determined by the will and not by circumstances or other people, so is not loving. The principle applies to everyone with whom Christ has come to dwell, especially fellow Christians. Loving others is an act of obedience and not loving them as an act of, di of disobedience. In, in John, 1 John chapter 4, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For well, the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. In the deepest sense, love is the only commandment that we've been given. Remember what, what Jesus said when asked about the greatest commandment. He said to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and to love our neighbor. So, so in the most simplistic form, the, the single command that we have been given is to love. God supremely and others sacrificially. This is what happens when Christ's love masters us. Look in, in Romans uh, chapter 13 verses 8 through 10. We owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments you shall not commit adultery you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the, is the fulfilling of the law. The absence of love is the presence of sin. The absence of love has nothing to do with what's happening to us, but everything to do with what is happening in us. They cannot coexist. Where one is, the other cannot reside. The difficult understanding of this passage is that a loveless life is an ungodly life. That's the difficulty of this passage. So when I evaluate, how did I love my wife this week? Was it sacrificially? How did I love my neighbor this week? Did I sacrifice myself in any way? My preferences, my privileges. When we are rooted and grounded in love, we then become able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the height or the breadth and length and height 
and depth of love. We cannot comprehend the fullness of love unless we are totally immersed in love. Unless it is the very root of our being. Someone asked the famed jazz trumpeter Louis Armstrong to explain jazz. <laughs> he replied, man, if I've got to explain it, you ain't got it. <laughs> That's almost the way it is with this supernatural love. I, I can't explain that. What would cause someone to love their neighbor so much that they would pray for them every time they drive in and out of their neighborhood? What would love them enough that they would want to go introduce themselves? That they would want to understand what's happening in that person's life? That they would try to minister to them in some way, looking for an opportunity to be selfless? What would cause a person to want to do that in a congregation of people? always on the lookout for a way that I can sacrifice myself for somebody else. That is unnatural in our flesh. But it is all that is natural in Christ. So we have this supernatural nature living in us. In verse 18, Paul says, you may have, may be strengthened to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Love is available to every Christian because Christ is available to every Christian. <laughs> every Christian has Christ. Paul prays that we will become able to comprehend with all the saints. Love is not simply for the even-tempered Christian or the naturally pleasant Christian or the agreeable Christian. Nor is it for some supposed special class of Christians who have an inside spiritual track on love. It is for and commanded of every Christian. He uses the words here, all the saints. Comprehension of love comes from being continually immersed in the things of God, especially his word. At the beginning of the year, Brother Bill gave us a challenge to begin making some habits in our lives. One of them is being in the word every week. One of them is blessing others. This is love lived out, us blessing others. That's a, that's a first step in this progression of handing someone one of these cards, inviting them here, and whether they can come here or not, get some answers to questions that we have about life. This doesn't require a whole lot of self-sacrifice. <laughs> me being willing to be a part of my neighbor's life, maybe even be at the hospital when there's something tragic happening. Maybe even going to them and repenting. Because you've not loved them this way. It's not an easy thing to do. Sometimes we need to. To comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth of love is to understand it in its fullness. Love goes in every direction to the greatest distance. It goes wherever it is needed for as long as it is needed. And if you're like me, you've had some of these discussions with yourself. Now, if I get involved with these folks, my, these neighbors or these friends, uh, they're, they're pretty needy. 
I, I got a feeling that's going to cost me. <laughs> that is my own flesh nature coming out and warring against this supernatural nature that says, I need to experience, I need to know the height and the depth. <laughs> as long as it takes, as far as it takes. In the beginning of verse 19, going through this progression, God fills us. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The word for fullness means to make full or to fill, not a hard one to understand. It's used many times in the New Testament. It speaks of total dominance, not something that I would associate with fullness. Total dominance. A person filled with rage is totally dominated by hatred. A person that is filled with happiness is totally dominated by joy. That's, that's the idea of biblically here that we get from this word filled up. We're totally dominated with something. To be filled up with all fullness of God means to be totally dominated by him with nothing left of self or any part of the old man. By definition then, to be filled with God is to be emptied of ourself. It is not to have much of God and little of self, but it is to have all of God and none of self. It is the fullness of Christ and fullness of the Spirit. What a God who loves us so much that he will not rest until we are completely like him. And then we can only sing as David did here in this uh, 2 Samuel chapter uh, 22. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge. My Savior, you saved me from violence. This is a result of being filled of, of God's fullness in us. God has filled us to the point to where we can't help but break out and just screaming out to God, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my Savior. That's what flows out of this heart that's, that's filled with God, with this life that's filled with God. Paul continues, God glorifies himself is the end result of this. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. In culmination of all that he has declared about God's limitless provision for his children, Paul gives this great doxology and fullness of praise and glory introduced now to him. When the Holy Spirit has empowered us, Christ has indwelled us, love has mastered us, and God has filled us with his own fullness, then he is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. In John chapter 14, beginning of verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the words that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Because I go to the Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do.
There is no situation in which the Lord cannot use us. Provided we are submitted to him, and as frequently pointed out in here in verse 20, this, this progression, um, this is, is, is another progression of enablement, if you will. He is able. The emphasis there is he. Not me in my own flesh. I, I have to be mastered by him. But he is the one that is able. He is able to do. In my life, regardless of where you find yourself this morning, you may be on the mountaintop and you may be trudging through a valley. He is able to do. Not just able to be for me, but able to do for me so that I can do for others in a selfless act of love. And what is he able to do? <laughs> Not just save me so that at some point when I die, I'm going to be with him in glory. Not the point. Not the point at all. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly here on this earth, in this life, using me. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we ask. <laughs> Begs the question, what are we asking for? When you travel around in other countries, you soon realize a lot of times we're a blessed people asking for more blessing. We've been given so much. Most countries, most people in, I don't know if it's half or two-thirds of the world, live on two dollars a day. We can come and go freely, have more than one car, have a house that's big, big enough for us to have shelter. We've been given time every week. Have a passport, travel anywhere in the world we want to go. Speak a language that is coveted by most. What am I asking for? He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we ask. <laughs> and this is God, or even think. There is no question in the minds of believers that God is able to do more than we can conceive. But I, I'm afraid that most of the time, even in my life, we enjoy the privileges of seeing him do that in our lives because we fail to follow a pattern of enablement. We don't really enjoy that privilege at all. Everything Paul did was in the power of God, and in the power of God there was nothing within the Lord's will that he could not see accomplished. That same power works within us by the presence of of the Holy Spirit. When we are surrendered to God, He is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Only then are we truly effective and only then is He truly glorified. And He deserves glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, not only now, but to all generations forever and ever. And amen here confirms that worthy goal. Paul's prayer for the church was that the Holy Spirit would enable us, that Christ would dwell in us, living comfortably here, <laughs> that Christ's love would totally master our lives, that God would fill us 
so that we're totally dominated by him and that God would glorify himself. If you're a follower of Christ this morning, this is my prayer for you. It should be our prayer for each other, our, our prayer for this congregation. If you're here this morning and you've not committed your life to Christ, you can experience this power. You can experience Christ dwelling in you. You can experience his love mastering you. You can experience his filling you and him bringing glory to himself. You can be a part of God being glorified in the church. My prayer for me and for you, for us, is that we would pray this for one another, that we would pray this for other congregations. These are worthy things. Culminating in all of that being glory to God himself. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this prayer. We thank you for an opportunity to, to work through it and to consider its claims on our lives. Father, I pray that, that you would empower us and dwell within us and would master us with love, that you would fill us. We would not desire to have anything living in us other than you. Certainly not being mastered by anything other than you. And that you would bring glory to yourself. Father, you have already given us these riches. As Paul prayed, I pray for us that we would be empowered by them for your glory alone. In Jesus' name.